This is from John 13, starting in verse 12. And the setting is that Jesus is sitting down to dinner with his closest friends, and it's the last time he will be with them before he is arrested, he's tortured, and he's crucified. Jesus had washed their feet, and he had put on his robe and returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Zealots were known for their abilities to attack Roman soldiers in broad daylight and get away with it. They were known for their abilities to attack and in some cases actually kill Roman soldiers in broad daylight and get away with it. Michael Frost, uh, Australian theologian, writes about zealots and, and says that in many ways they were like urban guerrillas uh, performing acts of terrorism against uh, both Rome's and in some cases like Jewish leadership. Uh, they were known for their use, their skilled use of what we would today call a stiletto blade. And what they would do is they would conceal this long, thin blade in the folds of their robes, and they looked for opportunities to get close to a Roman soldier uh, or a tax collector. And in, in the moments where there would be a, maybe a crowd of people, they'd kind of stand next to a soldier or a tax collector. They'd quietly slip and, and get close, and, and they would use the blade to attack the soldier or the tax, collecto, tax collector, and, and, and they would be gone. They would sort of vanish before uh, he'd hit the ground. Frost notes that it was not uncommon that after a street crowd had gathered and then dispersed, a Roman corpse was left in its wake. He even writes, he says, you know, you know, there's that story, right, about Zacchaeus, the tax collector who was short, and Jesus was coming along, and, and Zacchaeus climbs the tree so he could see Jesus. And we read that, and we think, oh, it's because he was short. But Michael Frost is like, I wonder if it was more than his short stature that got Zacchaeus up that tree that day. Uh, if you've been alive in the last 10 years or so, uh, you've witnessed an increasingly polarized political landscape in our country. My hope this week, as we're in this Recovering Kingdom Identity series, is that we can consider how Jesus' ministry might shape our approach to this current divide. Uh, and, and I think, I don't have to make this argument, I think perhaps this is one of the clearest areas of need when it comes to recovering kingdom identity, this sort of partisan divide that we find in our country. So, back to the zealots. Why were the zealots so intensely opposed to the Roman occupation? Well, a few things that are helpful here. Uh, beyond just the, the sort of obvious uh, uh, sort of empire oppressive regime of, of Rome, some, some details I think are helpful. Even though Rome was this sort of military might, uh, it was still pr predominantly an agrarian society, which means most of the, the economy uh, was, was driven by agriculture, right? And, and because agriculture was the basis of m not just Rome, but most ancient empires, Frederick Murphy notes uh, that the peasants, right, the, the sort of working class paid uh, and, and provided the economic engine for wars, for royal courts, for bureaucracies, religious establishments. And, and in the middle of all this, Jewish peasants, they had to feed their families to maintain their own sort of religious practices. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, the, the hard work, the oppressive sort of economic and, and social system that they're put into, not only is, is forcing them into hardship, but it, their hard work is, is being used to support the, the great Roman Empire, the, the great Roman apparatus that, that is oppressing them, right? So in some sense, they're, they're working hard and, and enslaved to the system where their work is, is increasing the uh, sort of oppressive yoke on, on their necks. And so you can imagine what, you know, the, the frustration. And, and so uh, 
people tried to push back in, in, in ways in, that they could. And some of that was sort of civil disobedience. And, um, and, and the zealots chose violence. And, and zealots, they were kind of like organized bandits, if you will. Um, think, like, think of like almost like a Robin Hood type figure, but uh, more violent than like cute and clever. Um, in some sense, they could be described as like religious extremists enacting violence. There were nominal ties to the Maccabees who rose up against Antiochus IV Epiphanes years earlier. Similar kind of vein, there was, they came from the countryside into the city, and so there was this sort of countryside antipathy toward city establishment types. Uh, they even at one point kind of like co-opted the uh, election of the high priest uh, in, in, of, for the high priesthood. And, and, and so there was this sort of like you know, religious zeal, borderline extremism that, that sort of characterized the zealots. And what does this have to do with our current political divide? This is what it has to do. Jesus, and we're going to explore this in a minute, Jesus invites us to an identity that eclipses our political affiliations. Jesus invites us to an identity that eclipses our political affiliations. And I think there's a tendency, if if you're like me, to kind of hear that and be like, well, yeah, of course. But I think it's helpful to unpack it a little bit further, especially looking at the text in John 13. But it sounds like good news, right? That Jesus invites us to an identity that eclipses our political affiliations. Um, and it's good news because I, I think if you're like me, I'm tired. I'm very tired of hearing things like, no follower of Christ could vote this way or that way. Or if you're a Christian, then you have to support this candidate or that candidate or whatever. Um, and, and this is the good news that we hear from Jesus, uh, that, that we're invited to something bigger and better. Um, but before we go on to that, I, I think it's, it's helpful to pause and to first take a moment to note that the intensity of our current political climate is not a new human experience. It has happened before. It may happen again. Uh, zealots took down representatives of, oppressive, of an oppressive regime uh, in broad daylight. And we think this world is so polarized that it's, it's impossible, it's, it's beyond our ability to love someone who, who believes or votes or acts different than us. And, and we think to ourselves, it can't be done. But the danger of that kind of thinking, of that line of thought, is that if we don't do this, if we don't love in a way that recognizes our ultimate allegiance to Jesus and his kingdom, if we don't do this, the very message of the good news of Jesus is at risk of being lost. This is, this is a weighty issue. If we don't recognize that Jesus invites us to a kingdom identity that eclipses our political affiliations, the very message of the good news of Jesus is at risk of being lost. If you don't believe me, listen to Jesus. So we're going to continue. We're going to look at, at, at John 13. And I think it's, it's helpful to take a moment and pause and say, why, why, are we looking at, why are we looking at John 13? Why are we looking at this text that was written you know, thousands of years ago, thousands of miles away? And, and we're doing this because we believe that this is one of the most specific, one of the most detailed descriptions of who the God of the universe is as seen in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And when we read scripture and specifically the gospels that we get to, uh, we get to this sort of detailed, specific look at the heart of the creator of the universe. And that shapes our understanding of not just who God is, but who we are and what our purpose is. So Jesus is sitting down to the Last Supper with his buddies, the last time that he's with them. And this is in John's Gospel. And it's his last night before his crucifixion. And, and Jesus, in an act of unspeakable humility and self-sacrificial love, kneels down and af assumes the role of a servant and washes their feet. And after he washes, he says, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right. That, you know, I am that. And he says, but... I've washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. 
And then he talks about Judas, and Judas is going to betray him. And then he has this sort of odd moment where he says to Judas, he says, do quickly what you're going to do. And he kind of like releases him to betray him into the hands of, of the officials. And then, and then the, there's, it continues. And, and then all of a sudden, right after he releases Judas, he, he, he goes into this like weird thing talking about the son of man, right? Jesus had gone, when Judas had left, Jesus said, now the son of man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. So I'm sure that's clear to all of us. Let's just move on. No, so, right. So, I mean, like confusing stuff, right? Imagine being a disciple in this moment, right? You've, you, all of a sudden this, this, rabbi that has been doing amazing things that you've been learning from for perhaps years um, all of a sudden he go, he washes your feet as, like a servant and then he starts talking about how Judas like your buddy that you've been hanging with for, is going to betray him and he says yeah go ahead and do the thing and then he starts talking about the son of man and, and being glorified and you know it's 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 hard for us to sort of pick up on that, but this title, Son of Man, is a title from a well-known passage in the Hebrew Scriptures that we find in Daniel 7, right? And this, you know, it's a, it's a Son of Man is, may not be a title that we're familiar with, but these guys hanging out with Jesus would have known the title well. It's from this apocalyptic, this prophetic vision from Daniel 7, uh, declaring how God will move to establish His kingdom on earth. The text is here in Daniel 7. It says, I saw one like a human being or son of man, other translations, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. And his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. And Jesus is sitting there with his buddies and saying, this son of man has been glorified. In other words, the hopeful vision that we see in Daniel 7 is now. It's now. He's celebrating how God has glorified this son of man who has promised to bring a universal kingdom of unrivaled authority that will be eternal and will never be destroyed And he says all of this right after he washed their feet. So he washes their feet. He talks about Judas betraying them. He starts talking about the Son of Man reference, implying that God's kingdom is now and at hand and is is being glorified. And then it continues. And this is where it gets really interesting. Just as he says, you ought to wash one another's feet, I've set you an example. Then he takes that to a whole new level and he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. So the context, of course, is that he's washed their feet. He's, he's self sacrificed in a way that that is uh, humble and and, and loving and as disciples of this God-ordained king bearing witness to his kingdom with his love like that is sort of he's saying look um, you uh, as I am like sort of glorified in this in this kingdom and the the sort of promised kingdom that that God is bringing about that, that we see in Daniel 7 it's all getting big it's great it's you know it's happening it's now God is being glorified I you know it's 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 happening oh and by the way um love each other in ways that I just love you I'm entering into my kingdom that will be established here and now and is, it will be universal and it will have unrivaled authority. It will never end. And, and you guys are my closest friends. And, and by the way, um, wash one another's feet. Assume the role of servants. And if that's not crazy enough, if it's not crazy enough for, for Jesus to say, I want you to love with, with self-sacrifice, with humility, uh, with giving toward one another, um, if that's not enough, I, he takes it even a step further because if we stop and think about 
Who is there with Jesus? It's his disciples. It's, it's, it's his, the, his closest, uh, the, like the apostles with him there. And, and here uh, we look in Matthew 10 and, and, and we just get a glimpse, a, a list of, of the 12 apostles who were there with Jesus in this moment in the Last Supper. This is first, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. There are other translations that translate Simon the Canaanian as Simon the Zealot. It was a word that was used in some ways interchangeably. So there, we see the list in Matthew 10, and, and we see that um, in, the, in his text that the, the, the apostles were with him in this Last Supper later on. And here it's listed them out, and we see that there is Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. And zealots were known for killing tax collectors. So how is a group of people loving one another, even self-sacrificial, how is that radical or revolutionary? It's radical and it's revolutionary because in all likelihood, sitting at the very table that Jesus was there washing their feet were two men that would have killed each other were it not for Jesus reclaiming their identity into his kingdom of peace. Jesus has given them a new identity, and he says, I am the, the, the Son of Man is being glorified, They're, the kingdom is here, and it's now, and you all have this new identity. And Simon the Zealot, Matthew the tax collector, those things do not define you any further. You are a participant, you are a citizen of my kingdom, and people will know that you're my disciples by how you guys love one another. And Jesus is saying that the way you will participate in and build my kingdom is by living out my love, which is stronger than hate. How does that translate to us? What does that mean? Um, I, it, it could be helpful to think of, of the, look at a broader view of the landscape among the first century Jewish people in this region. Zealots were known. Zealots were known for their support of violence to oppose the empire. Pharisees were known for their strict Torah interpretation and observance to oppose the empire. Sadducees were known for their positions of privilege and acquiescence to the empire. Essenes were known for their choice to remove themselves from society to protest and challenge the empire. And here comes Jesus, and he says, My disciples will be known by how they serve one another with a self-sacrificial love in in, in an identity that eclipses any other identity they had before. You're a tax collector that is selling out to the, selling out your own people to the empire. You're a zealot who who would seek in all likelihood the the end of the tax collector. No No longer, no more. You're my disciple. You're a citizen in my kingdom. My disciples will be known by how they serve one another with a self-sacrificial love. To lay down their identity as zealots or Pharisees or Sadducees or tax collectors or Republicans or Democrats or Libertarians. To claim their ultimate identity as a beloved child of their creator, their identity as a new creation in Christ, their identity as a Christ follower. Of course, we see this, you know, the Apostle Paul picks up on this. Uh, He addresses the totality of this new identity in in his second letter to the church in Corinth. Years later, as as he he encourages the church in Corinth, he says, you know, if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. And John, in, in John 3 earlier, Jesus alluded to this idea, this sort of concept where he tells Nicodemus, a Pharisee, there's the, anyone who wants to see or enter the kingdom must be born anew or born from above. 
this sort of new birth, continued process of, of uh, uh, reclaiming a new identity as a participant or a citizen of this kingdom. So now what? What, what, is, what does that mean? Um, here's an example. When an overwhelming number of our black and brown citizens and neighbors are fellow beloved children of our Creator, when these kin of ours in our society are crying out that their lives are under threat, when they're shouting that they have been and continue to be systematically oppressed for centuries by both explicit and implicit, both personal and systemic racism, a new kingdom identity in Christ, a new kingdom identity in Christ means our response is a response primarily shaped by Christ's love, by compassion, by empathy, a hunger for truth, attentiveness, humility, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-sacrifice, a new kingdom identity in Christ means that our primary concern is responding in a way that embodies the spirit and image of our King. It means that our first response is not, is not to immediately consider what the right response is as a Republican or a Democrat or a Green Party or Libertarian. A commitment to a political party at best comes in somewhere well behind our commitment to Christ and His kingdom. Faithfulness to the kingdom supersedes faithfulness to a political party. Because a kingdom identity holds Christ and His kingdom preeminent in all things. A kingdom identity holds Christ and His kingdom preeminent in all things. Preeminent, what, what, is, what does that mean? Surpassing all others. A kingdom identity holds Christ and his kingdom in a way that surpasses all other things. Our identity as citizens in Christ's kingdom surpasses all other ways that we identify ourselves. Let that sink in. Our identity as citizens of Christ's kingdom surpasses all other ways that we identify ourselves. If you think of, bear with me, the sun versus the moon, right? Think of the sun and the moon. The sun, and forgive my you know, lack of expertise with the, the, the in-depth sort of descriptions of, scientific descriptions of the sun and the moon. It's a very sort of base level uh, you know, approach here. But the sun, in, in some sense, right, is, is a, it's, it's a fireball of explosive energy. <laughs> it's just life is spilling out of it. The moon, you know, is a cold, relatively lifeless rock. It gives off light, but only as a reflection of the sun, right? It doesn't produce its own light. And if you think of a solar eclipse, right? And, and this is the moment where the moon comes between the earth and the sun, right? And so, you know, there's if you diagram here, there's the sun. A solar eclipse is when the moon comes in between uh, the earth and the sun. And so the, the, the moon is sort of, uh, the sun is providing this backdrop to the moon and, and it kind of, the moon blocks out the, the light from the sun. And so the sun, the sort of source of life for our planet is eclipsed by a cold, dead rock. Do you see where I'm going with this? I think Christ and his kingdom are the sun in this sense, the source of life for us as new creations in Christ. And what we have done too often, I've done it myself, like we, we're all, I think many of us are, are guilty of this. We have allowed our political parties a cold, dead rock to eclipse our source of life. We sometimes see our political parties first, like the moon, and God's kingdom second, like a solar eclipse. I'm not saying, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we should totally disengage and not participate in a political party. 
we're all allowed to disagree about the policies by which we long to see greater shalom and wholeness, restoration in this world. But what we need is to avoid the solar eclipse and embrace more of like a lunar eclipse, right? The lunar eclipse is kind of like the opposite where uh, you have the sun here, you have the earth. And so there's this, the, the source of life is there's a direct pathway, right? From the source of life to earth. And, and then the moon, of course, is behind. And the moon is there but it's sort of secondary at best. We're still intimately connected to the source of life. And there's nothing between the earth and the sun, nothing between the earth and the source of life. The moon is still there, it's not gone altogether, but in relation to the source of life, it's no longer getting in the way. You can still participate in a political party, but make sure it's situated behind you as you're facing the source of life. Make sure it's situated well behind you as you're facing the source of life, Christ and his kingdom. In other words, seek first the kingdom. Jesus said that. Seek first the kingdom. Specifically, what does that mean? How do we apply that? What does that look like? Here's a simple one. When there's an issue, political issue, or, or there's an event that happens in our world, that needs to be addressed, that, that we, we're not called to disengage. We're not called to just close our eyes and, you know, just sing worship songs and, 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 and sort of live this sort of spirit, spiritual life that doesn't acknowledge the, the pain and brokenness of our world. That's not what we're called to. Because there are things that we need to wrestle with, we need to lean into, and, and there are issues, there are events that have to be addressed. We have to acknowledge those things. We can ask ourselves, who do we listen to with these issues, with these events? Who do we listen to? Do we listen to loud people or do, we, or do we listen to wise people? Do we listen to loud people or wise people? Who do we read? Do we read caustic Twitter feeds absent of, of civility and, and grace and, in, and good information and scholarship? Or, or do, we, do we read wise and eloquent Christ followers, both contemporary and ancient. Who do you watch? Do you watch news pundits? Or do you watch pastors, theologians, other ministry leaders that are forging paths forward that are reflective of Christ's kingdom and, and his heart? In other words, who influences us? Is it people who sound and look just like us, or, is, or are we willing to listen to perspectives that challenge our own? Let's get more specific. Uh, does MSNBC influence your participation in Christ's kingdom? Or does your participation in Christ's kingdom affect how you watch MSNBC? Does Fox News tell you how to think about Christ? Or does Christ tell you how you should think about Fox News? Who influences us? Who has the primary place of influence in our lives? And why does it matter? Why is this important? Why do we keep our, our, par our partisanship way behind our kingdom identity? Again, let's, let's look at verse 35 where Jesus says, I give you a commandment, new, love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, in verse 35, this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Zealots are known for their violence. Pharisees are known for their Torah interpretation. Sadducees are known for their privilege and acquiescence to the empire. You will be known by your love for one another. You will be known by your love that transcends, that eclipses any other identity you had before me. That's how people will know that you're my disciples. And that is how people will see the movement and, and beauty and glory of my kingdom. And it matters because we cannot effectively bear witness to Christ and his kingdom if we do not love one another as Christ has loved us. We cannot bear witness to Christ and his kingdom if we do not love one another as Christ has loved us. A little sidebar here. Love does not mean, love does not mean agreeing with everyone else. I think our culture is bought into this lie that to love someone means you have to agree with everything and refuse to respectfully disagree. That's just not true. 
Love can include disagreement. Cancel culture is on the left or right. I don't, you know, maybe the left calls it cancel culture, the right calls it something else. The, the refusal to engage with someone just based on, like, that is, that is not gospel. And also, love does not mean abandoning boundaries. Love does not mean agreeing with everyone else, but love does, and love does also not mean <laughs> abandoning boundaries. There is a time and a place to create loving, healthy boundaries to protect yourself and others from deep wounding. If you need to take a break from someone's Facebook posts and someone, by all, it's, it's okay. You can create some boundaries. There's this story of Cody and Andrew. Here's a picture of them. It's a story by uh, Hannah Alam. Cody is a member of the a three percenter affiliated militia group, right wing. Andrew is an organizer with the Black Lives Matter activists. Alam writes, Andrew and Cody sit on opposite coasts and opposite sides of the political spectrum, each representing the movements accused by the other of fueling domestic terrorism. It's unlikely they ever would have met, much less struck up a dialogue were it not for their chance connection through a German settler who lived two centuries ago. You see, in researching family ancestry, they realized uh, that they were cousins. And so these guys who politically almost could not be more opposite realized that they're cousins. And there was obvious hesitation in being willing to getting to know one another, but they developed a relationship with one another. They latched onto common interests such as music. You know, Cody plays the banjo and Andrew produces hip hop. So there's a lot of spillover there. They traded, you know, family lore, family stories about moonshiners and war deserters. Um, and, you know, they're honest about struggling with their pain of uh, they've both lost, you know, relationship with other family members based off of their political convictions from, you know, the different ends of it, of course. And the relationship is not perfect. I mean, the article was, was very clear that there's challenge there, that there's disagreement. And, but Andrew said, he, he says in the article, he says, but I think it's worth pursuing at least some sense of commonality because we've got to live in the same country as a lot of other people we disagree with. So here we have two guys opposite ends of the spectrum, and yet there's a shared bond with an identity. An identity as, as cousins, as family. And that identity runs deeper, it grows stronger, it eclipses the other identities that, defi- that divide them. And friends, when we claim our kingdom identity as preeminent, By God's grace, we will receive his love that's powerful enough to transform our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And that love propels us toward loving others in a way that does not make sense unless Jesus was right and his kingdom is here on earth as it is in heaven. The the, the Son of Man has been glorified and his kingdom is now and it is forever and it is unrivaled and it is universal and it will never be destroyed. This is a love that would compel the creator of the universe to wash the dirty feet of his followers. It's a love that would compel a zealot and a tax collector toward a new identity that eclipses their old identities and inspires them to love each other as brothers. A love that shouts, that shouts, we are disciples of Christ the King. May we recover this identity friends. May we recover this identity and bear witness to the good news of Christ our King. Amen.